Hi. On June 5th and 6th, 2024, I'll be speaking at the largest AI event in Asia, Super AI in Singapore, at the iconic Marina Bay Sands. Alongside brilliant minds like Benedict Evans, Balaji, and Edward Snowden, I'll be on stage exploring the extraordinary potential of AI and the profound change it represents, not just for financial markets, but for the world as we know it. With over 5,000 attendees and over 150 side events, Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a full week from June the 3rd to the 9th. Visit realvision.com forward slash super AI to register and join me with 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION, all in caps. Hi, I'm Raoul Powell. And welcome to my show, The Journeyman. The Journeyman, as you probably know by now, is me traveling to the nexus of macro, crypto, and the exponential age of technology. You see, there is a lot going on, as I always mention, and you can see from all of the guests I bring, the broad depth of what interests me in what's going on, whether it's NFT artists or whether it's technology or whether it's crypto. But one of the other things that interests me a lot is health and lifestyle. And I'm going to be doing some series on wine and other lifestyle stuff because I know you guys are interested in that. But healthcare and health, health span, longevity, those are things that interest me because obviously I'm in my mid-50s, so it matters to me, but it should matter to everybody. And technology is accelerating at an incredible pace. So things are changing. And what your doctor knows or you how you get advised these days is not current medicine. It's not current technology. And, you know, we've all read things like David Sinclair's book or Peter Attia, but things are even further advanced than that because by the time a book gets published, it's kind of two years out of date. So anyway, one of the biggest things about how to unfuck your future, if you think of a lot of what I'm trying to do, is really get get you in the best way to live your life. So you live it in the way that you want to achieve some of the hopes and dreams that we don't get all of our hopes and dreams, but really it's that vision of your future self to deliver it to you. I think the key vision for all of us is when we get older, we want to be healthy. We don't want to be maybe like our parents have been or others around us, where we may live longer than previous generations, but we're still ill for a long period of time. So I really want to explore this topic with you all and you know, it's a topic that I've gone down the rabbit hole on for the last, well, since Tim Ferriss actually came on Real Vision back in 2014. He really got me down this path. It took me a while, um, but then from Tim's podcasts, and if you haven't watched the, the interview with Tim, you should do. Uh, it's a really interesting podcast, and it's from the early days of Real Vision, but a lot of what he said stands true to this day, um, and that that's well worth watching. I don't think it's on YouTube, so it's on the Real Vision platform. Um, but watch that. But today, I'm really interested. I was speaking to Peter Diamandis a while ago, and Peter talked about Fountain Life, a business that he had helped build, which is a clinic around which they analyze your entire body and look at preventative medicine. They look at the, the your kind of genetic makeup. They look at your biome. They look at all sorts of things. And ascertain what the probability is that you may have certain ailments later in life, how to address them in advance, or if you've got more advanced issues going on and you don't notice you're asymptomatic, then they'll look at that um, and figure out what is the latest technology to help you in your journey and your health span. And the idea is to get your health span up to, I don't know, 100 years old. Anyway, I think you're going to find this fascinating. I think you should take a pen and paper and listen to this conversation with Dr. William Cap. Okay, enjoy it. I'll speak to you at the end. Join me, Raoul Powell, as I go on a journey of discovery through the macro, crypto, and exponential age landscapes. In The Journeyman, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. Bill, I'm really excited to have you on Real Vision. Thank you for joining us. A oh, pleasure to be here. I look forward to it. So, look, there's a lot to talk about. Firstly, 
We won't, we'll go into more detail about it, but what do you do now? And then we'll get into your journey of how the hell you got here in the first place, because that's going to be fascinating. So what do you do now? Sure. So, uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for having me. I, I am uh, the CEO of Fountain Life, which is a proactive preventative care platform. And our mission in life is to uh, totally reconstruct healthcare or totally redesign healthcare from a reactive posture, which is what we've been doing for years to a proactive posture and advancing the latest technology to detect disease at its very earliest stages and reverse it while you're still asymptomatic so that you never have to deal with it later. Amazing. So how did you get on to, how did you get into this? To, give me a background because. Yeah. So I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training. Uh, I spent a number of years in orthopedic surgery. I have a background in molecular genetics as well. I had spent about 30 years in the traditional, I would call hospital sick care space, meaning uh, waiting in uh, what we would today we would call healthcare, but we call sick care inside of our ecosystem and uh, literally built hospitals and surgery centers and imaging centers. And it was about six years ago that we started to see the advent of the technology that was fundamentally going to be able to reshape healthcare, meaning from a symptom based healthcare system to a proactive system, uh, very similar to the evolution of the aviation industry. I'm an Air Force flight surgeon and you know, and I'm also a, a rated pilot. So I would just tell you, you know, we don't get in the jet and uh, and fly it across the Atlantic without doing a systems check and doing preventive maintenance on the aircraft. But yet when you go to your doctor's office for your preventive maintenance, you get a, kind of get a walk around, right? And we use old tools. The stethoscope is 200 years old. Uh, the reflex hammer was invented in 1930. And, uh, and we don't use that technology on the front end. We use that technology on the back end after you're sick. And so the, the opportunity, uh, about six years ago, we built a, a center here in Naples, Florida. And then about two years ago, or I ship four years ago, Tony Robbins and Peter Diamandis came to Naples, Florida, where I live and saw what we were doing here and said, we really need to scale this into a national company and see if we can make a dent in this healthcare problem, which is becoming a bigger, bigger problem, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Uh, we're spending, as you know, uh, four point three trillion dollars on healthcare in the United States, and we're it's about twenty percent of GDP, and it doesn't show any signs of abating. And outside the fiscal deficits that we deal with, uh, the healthcare deficit is just as bad, and so uh, the outcomes just aren't there. So we built the the company, and we've been really on this mission ever for the last four years, and it's been wildly um, exciting. Uh, it's uh, disruptive, I think, to several of the players in the industry, as you might imagine. But I believe it's the only uh, real path forward uh, because everything else that I did in my prior career was aimed at trying to lower healthcare costs and improve outcomes. But that was geography, meaning we move you from the hospital to the surgery center. Or we move you from the hospital to your home for care. But we weren't doing root cause analysis and we weren't really trying to dig down into why do we have the problem in the first place. So that was the exciting part of what we're doing today. So let's talk about the scale of the problem when i've been looking at this i mean the united states is particularly bad you know it's obviously it spends more per capita on healthcare than any other nation in the world yet it's the 42nd longest living nation i right. mean the outcomes are appalling now obviously mediterranean europe somewhat different but the uk is not great and a lot of nations what the hell is going on so I think a part of it has to do with the fact that, you know, it, it, I think this is, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, changes that happen over time in healthcare. And I think we have really gone from what I call the macro, meaning, you know, back 200 years ago, it was wash your hands, uh, kill the rats, throw out the garbage, uh, to the micro where we, you know, harness the power of microorganisms and antibiotics and antivirals. So once you eliminate a lot of the things that were responsible for early death, uh, and, and you start to eliminate those reasons for dying early, then you're faced with chronic disease, meaning that we allow people to live much, much longer. But in the process, uh, you know, by eliminating most of the things that used to keep you living around age 35, now we are living to the 70s and 80s. And so these disease processes that are at a molecular level, not a micro, but even a molecular level, now have a chance to kind of get root. And they take a long time to eventually develop over, uh, you know, uh, maybe 30 years in some cases. And it, we, they only become symptomatic until when they're late stage. So it's like a very slow burning fire. And then you grip your chest with chest pain, even though the plaque has been building in your arteries for the last 20 to 30 years. And up until now, every test we've had have been, has been inferential, but not necessarily, uh, 
specific to how much plaque do you have? It should have, it have in your arteries and can you reverse that? So I think when you look at the, the problem in healthcare, so there are a couple of things. One is the U.S. healthcare is uh, the largest free market for healthcare in the world. So that is, that is a component of the problem. The other component of the problem in the United States is that nobody is paid to keep you healthy. We don't pay doctors to keep you healthy. That's the fundamental problem that we have. We need two paradigm shifts. Uh, one of the paradigm shifts needs to be that we need to take people uh, from this reactive, episodic, symptomatic-based care to a proactive platform, just like you would with a pilot or just like you would with an aircraft. But more importantly, we need to change the payment model because the payment uh, incentives are misaligned for the treatment of sick care and not the treatment of prevention. And we've never treated prevention in the United States uh, like they do in Eastern uh, in throughout Europe. I mean, Europe has been a heavy user of preventive health services, but part of that is because the government's on the on the hook for the bill, the entire bill. And so it's it's a national security issue, uh, and it's certainly a national priority. Here in the U.S., we don't do that very well. And I think COVID, if it had one, uh, if there's one glimmer of COVID that was positive, it did it did expose how weak the U.S. healthcare system is in terms of prevention. So. I think that's the core. I think um, the reality is uh, our data, and we can certainly happy to walk you through that, has shown that if we catch disease when we catch it using our platform versus when you become symptomatic and it is normally found, uh, and you treat it early when we find it at the very incipient stage, you can lower healthcare costs by 70 to 80%. It's a massive, massive change. And it also means that you can make your health span match your lifespan meaning you don't need to live, live the last 10 years of your life in decline. You can actually intercept, hopefully over the next 10 years, the technologies that are coming that are going to extend the healthy human lifespan even further. So before you even look at the preventative side, the the, the analysis of, of you know, people's, people's bodies, there's got to be some sort of behavioral shift in how people treat their bodies. And it's quite hard because it's a long-term time horizon. Humans aren't very good with long-term reward systems. They're only good with short-term reward systems. So how do you how do you think we should approach that in terms of, you know, diet, exercise and stress and all of the, you know, the the things that are proven over time to help drive health? There, there is no doubt that behavioral uh, modification is number one and two uh, when we talk about healthcare. The, the, the reality is, though, today, when you think about the myriad of things we're trying, everybody wants a quick fix, and there is no such thing as a quick fix. But what you can do is you can create, uh, you know, a you can draw a picture for people in terms of when I say that. For instance, if I want you to reverse your cardiac plaque, and I show you how much cardiac plaque you have in your vessels, and it's no longer a guess, meaning, oh, your LDL is elevated, so you must have plaque, and so you need to take this statin. Uh, for the first time, you see a picture of your arteries. And at least in our population, of course, we do have a more compliant population in terms of people that want to improve their health. But the reality is a picture is worth a thousand words. And when people see what their body looks like on the inside, we get a lot of behavioral change. Because when you see that your liver is full of fat and you know that that's going to lead to a liver transplant possibly one day, you will change what your behavior is. And I think part of the problem is so many of our tests in medicine are inferential, meaning we use a population-based methodology when we render healthcare. We say, if you have high blood pressure and you're a white 50-year-old male, here's the pill that you should take today, okay? Or you have elevated LDL and you need to take this statin. And while you look at that in a population sense, uh, you know, uh, it, it might make sense over a large uh, expanse of a population. The challenge is that most people want an N of one solution and we don't provide that for them. So quite frankly, we could tell you, uh, we have a lot of people with elevated LDL that would normally be put on a statin, but when we check their coronary arteries, they're clear. So how do you make that argument for needing the LDL? You, you, there's there's this, this idea that, you know, we, uh, we provide generic recommendations when people have in, live in a world where almost everything is customized to the individual, everything from your iPhone to what you like to do on a behavioral basis, how you like to exercise is customized to the individual. So I think what is important when you want to achieve behavioral change, number one, show the picture is, show somebody where their baseline is, number one, and show them what, what could be, and then guide them through that. And one of the things that is the problem in healthcare, because we practice symptom-based healthcare and it's episodic, you only see the doctor when you're having symptoms. And so the problem is, 
you really need a not only a proactive platform, but you need a continuous platform. And more importantly, you actually need your own data. If you have your digital twin in your hand and your phone, and you can see what behavioral metrics are changing your overall body, it becomes a very different discussion, at least with our clients uh, today, than maybe what you might see in a traditional preventive medicine, you know, primary care setting. And do you think um, there is chances of reversing some of this stuff? So let's say you have a high calcium score from from you know, a scan in your heart, so i.e. you've got a plaque buildup, because the medical profession tells you you can't do anything about it. That's therefore... absolutely, but that's absolutely false. I mean, that is that is that. So when you when you look at what is going on in healthcare today, so one of the challenges is also there is a thing called the clinical latency gap, meaning from the time at which a technology or a treatment is proven to the time it's widely adopted in medicine is about seventeen years. Wow! So the iPhone is actually more current today, uh, and if you can imagine when the iPhone one came out. That's kind of where we practice medicine today. So within, in a world of exponential technologies, we have two, two facets that are really slowing us down. One is the medical schools are behind in what they teach. They teach sick care very well. They don't teach prevention very well. But the second part of that is this clinical latency gap. And so for instance, in the case of coronary plaque, Dean Ornish 20 years ago proved that you can reverse heart disease with a, with a low fat diet. He's already proven that. We can tell you in our clientele, uh, once we see what their plaque score is, that on average, our average client has about a 40% reduction in plaque over 9 to 12 months. And that's a combination of exercise, diet, and some uh, pharmaceuticals. But the reality is you can reverse heart disease. You certainly can reverse even insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes. And you can reverse early cognitive decline. This this data is out there. This is not new. This is well known to the functional medicine community, but it's not taught because there's no emphasis on prevention in the U.S. health system. No, and you you get the impression that once you bump up against the healthcare profession, there tends to be an enormous amount of arrogance. Oh, it's absolutely. Like, we know what we know, and you are an idiot for questioning us. And they yeah. say things like, "Well, you're just watching stuff on YouTube. What do you know? I'm the expert." It's like it's weird. And yes, of course, there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. But, you know, assuming people are smart enough to learn from a lot of people, but the, but the general medical profession is terrible with this. Well, they're very bad at adopting new, uh, new technology and they're very bad at adopting new treatment modalities, especially if it threatens the bottom line. And look, I, I was in that population for a long time. I practiced orthopedics for a number of years. You go to your academy and you, you, you have the top guys in the field that are passing down knowledge from on high and you're you're you know you're the lowly ones down below you know receiving that knowledge but what you don't realize is how corrupt that the US health system has become and it's not universal but I will tell you it's rare that I go to my orthopedic academy anymore and the top guys giving the top lectures are all sponsored by 10 to 15 com companies and they have to put their disclaimers up there and so then the question becomes how how valid is the data and so I, I don't want to impugn my colleagues' motives, but I will tell you that, that the reality is most physicians are not up. They tend to be down on what they're not up on. And the reality is uh, they kind of stop learning when they leave medical school. Yeah. And they, live, they learn incrementally. And the technology is moving so fast that they're un, they're un, you know, they, they are unaware and they pr probably are unwilling to adopt the new technology at a rapid pace. And then beyond that, they're not paid for it. So it's really hard to get them to understand things like this. I mean, I give this talk frequently around the country and I will tell you, um, I have physicians who stand up and say, I don't understand why you're doing whole body on people, whole body MRI on people. You're just going to find things. And they say it with a totally straight face. Okay. But, and why do they say that? They, they say that because they remember the, ex, the technology 20 years ago when MRI was still relatively new. And we were getting false you know, signals and we didn't know what those were. And so we were doing a lot of biopsies and needle biopsies, trying to find out what things were. But what they failed to realize is that imaging technology has gone just as exponential as genomic technology. And the reality is the technology is so good today that the false positive rate is well under 1%. So when we do find things, 
they tend to be significant. And yet most physicians are unaware of it. Most of physicians are unaware you can get a whole body MRI, that it's even available. And you know, it's certainly getting more widely available with Pranubo and Ezra and some of the other companies doing it today. But I, I do think that we just, we really are looking at a pretty arcane way of doing prevention. And it has to be changed. And 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 the medical establishment is not, um, you know, it's interesting. It's a little generational. Uh, you know, I would tell you, you know, I'm 62. So everybody my age and older doesn't really like change. I mean, I enjoy it, but most people don't. Uh, but I will tell you, the younger generation is very data centric. And your doctors that are millennials and um, Gen X doctors tend to be very data centric. And they really like what we're doing. They're unfortunately kind of stuck in a model that doesn't really work for them right now. How are you dealing with the speed of innovation with genetic sciences, diagnostics, and you know all of this? I mean, it's a lot to try and process, right? I mean, I, I tell, I, I have to remind our teams frequently, uh, and we have almost two hundred people in the company now. But I, I have to remind them on a constant basis that what we're doing on a day to day basis is still light years ahead of what is available in your primary care doctor's office. And even then, every day we see an innovation that's coming across that could potentially be disruptive. So I think uh, we manage it because we have a group of, uh, of uh, scientific advisors. We have uh, Dr. Mark Hyman, we have Dr. Eric Verdin from the Buck Institute, and we also have Dr. Daniel Kraft, as well as Peter and a group of our others, including our chief medical officer, Dr. Helen Messier. And they help to uh, vet all of the newest technologies coming through for safety and efficacy. And so we look at these on a constant basis. We have a once a week round table where all the new technologies are coming out and we decide what we're going to bring into the fountain platform and which ones we don't. But as far as the genomics platform and where we are with the, all of the rest of it, I mean, really artificial intelligence is making a huge difference in being able to query your genome. And we have a very robust uh, digital platform that we can upload your entire genome and then we can query it. Meaning if there's a particular variant we want to search in the 3.2 billion base pairs, we can do that now. And that would not have been available uh, five years ago, but today due to machine learning and, and, and some of the newer uh, AI programs that are out there, you can actually search somebody's entire genome for a variant if you have a question. How else are you going to use AI? Because it's obviously the big disruptor in the space because you can process so much more information, A, at you know, system-wide level, I looking at what research is coming out and trying to filter that, but also down to, you know, just finding things faster. Yeah. So there, there's several ways we use it. We use it for image detection because quite frankly, you know, uh, the cardiac scanning, and we can get into that talking about how we determine how much black you have. That's an AI protocol. Uh, it's, a, it's an old test. It's called a coronary CT angiography, where we put a little dye in your vein and we take a quick CAT scan of your heart. But we used to read it with the human eye, which is fine, but it's not nearly as accurate as the AI. And so when we look at it with an AI overlay, we can measure not only how much plaque you have, but where it is in your arteries, whether it's in the wall of the artery, what's on the outside of the wall of the artery, whether it's significant or not. And so that's why the calcium score, while being beneficial, saying, yes, you do have coronary plaque, means nothing unless you have the AI overlay to tell you how much plaque you have and where it is, particularly soft plaque because that's what we're looking for. That's the vulnerable plaque that we're- Because that's the plaque that breaks off and cause blockages. Correct. The calcified plaque is actually stable. And so it doesn't break off. Break off. But there's some really, uh, really unique, uh, matter of fact, it's, it's out of the UK. There's a brand new technology uh, by a, a company called uh, Caristo uh, that is coming to the US and we'll be utilizing it here shortly. That not only can look at how much plaque you have, but it can tell you how much inflammation you have in the wall of the vessel for the very first time with an AI algorithm. So once again, this is imperceptible to the human eye, but it is really good when you use AI in computer learning and because it really has to do with how many pixels at a microscopic level that can be detected by the AI. So it's certainly those types of things we're seeing for AI. We, we see it, uh, lots of impact in imaging and certainly a lot of impact in genomics. But what we have with our very unique database is we can absorb any of your Omics, meaning your genomics, your microbiome, uh, your all of your scans, uh, all of your medical history into a very comprehensive database where you have a digital twin that it populates. And now we're now for the first time starting to uh, use uh, generative AI on those uh, on that data set. We believe we've we probably have uh, compiled the largest asymptomatic data set out there, meaning people who don't have any symptoms but have disease. And so what we're in the process do, of doing now using 
uh, you know, some of the new generative AI tools is actually training our AI on our own proprietary data set because, you know, the, the large language models are great and there's a lot of foundational models, but they have to be trained. And so the reality is it's our physicians who are functional medicine root cause analysis trained who are helping us to train this AI. And where does that lead us? What that means in the future is not that doctors are going to be eliminated. I don't believe doctors will be eliminated for a while um, because the doctors have to, number one, train the data sets. And then people still, you know, I always I joke with my friends in the U.S. and my, uh, my friends here in the U.S. Uh, the attorneys are going to keep the physicians in, in working, probably, because we haven't got. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. Because there's just too much liability involved in letting the AI provide all your medical care. Uh, we haven't gotten rid of pilots yet even though the, the the jumbo jets can pretty much fly themselves. So I'm not so sure we're quite ready to get rid of physicians, but it is very clear that your doctor who is not using AI will be replaced because he's just not going to be able to ma ma uh, you know, manage the massive amount of inf uh, information. But what we get excited is the opportunity when your AI can read your data set and start to make recommendations for you as an individual. Uh, the early applications for it that I really like are the ability to take a complicated medical uh, document and then translate it into layman's terms. And that can be done with AI. So for now, uh, instead of your body being a black box and the doctor giving you uh, essentially what is a Greek manuscript written in medical terms, you can now find out what's going on inside your own body. So I think that's very important. I think where we really see healthcare going, and I think the ultimate logical progression is healthcare will go to your home at some point fairly quickly, meaning that air quality, water quality, sleep quality, your, your home will become a wearable, meaning you'll have sensor technology in your home. You won't have to wear an R ring or an Apple watch. It'll just collect the data. And we have that technology now, and that will really populate your own personal data cloud. And over time, that your lifestyle data will be married with your healthcare data. And then you can see the overlap. And now you start to really see, uh, you know what, I slept last night and my cortisol levels are much lower uh, if I slept well. Or you can start to see changes in behavior, you know, around dietary and exercise and muscle mass, making impact on biomarkers that we know uh, are, help, are helpful for you to determine what's going on in your body. So I think you know, moving healthcare from the four walls of the doctor's office and the purvey of only doctors and nurses to giving you enough information about your body that you can start to make real substantive change and be able to track it over time is going to be the real change in healthcare. And that's where people get excited about, you know, getting their data back. Well, also, it goes back to the conversation we had at the beginning. Um, it becomes behaviorally easier if you're getting real time data as opposed to periodic data when you're not feeling good or or you happen to do your annual or every two year health checkup, which is a snapshot. But this, as you say, you can see what really affects you in real time. Yeah. So, you know, so we've seen the uh, continuous blood glucose monitors, right? So up until yeah. just recently, matter of fact, now you can buy them at the grocery store. You used to not be able to buy them without a prescription, right? So now they're going to be available for the first time. But what we know is behavioral change comes when you have a closed feedback loop in a relatively short period of time. That's why people like video games, right? They get immediate feedback, right? right? And, that, and that immediate feedback makes a big difference in behavioral change. But what we can do with the CGM, because we're measuring your blood sugar every 15, at 15 minute intervals or 10 minute intervals, you can see what happens when you had that glass of red wine or you ate that donut. I mean, and all of a sudden now you get immediate feedback. Right. So now you start to see the behavioral change start to occur. And all of that sensor technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. It's going to be embedded. Uh, whether you wear, use a, I, I don't personally believe people are going to do wear implantables. I know some people say they will. I'm not so sure that most people are ready to have their skin cut open to stick a, stick, stick a probe in. But I will tell you that the technology we're seeing right now is going to be much, much easier to access. In, and what we're working on in several projects now is embedding Fountain Life into residential communities where it becomes paid for through your HOA. And so this becomes like your homeowner's fee actually covers the cost of your preventive services. And the idea is it's in your home. And once you're in your home, now we can start to help you with nutritional guidelines. We can help you deliver the right food that you may need for your microbiome. We can deliver the right exercise program for you that it fits your genetics. I mean, you may be somebody who's a slow fast or a, or a, or a fast switch muscle fiber person. You might be somebody that is an endurance athlete. You can look at all that with your genetics and optimize the type of exercise program you really need. 
to, and, and really the biggest uh, thing we have seen in the last couple of years, and we're excited, we just started doing this at Fountain, is measuring your mitochondrial health. I was going to ask about both the mitochondrial health and also microbiome, which yes. is two areas that are kind of under-discussed, but seem of crucial importance. Yeah, I'd love so to hear actually, a bit more. those are probably the two most uh, uh, yeah, highly uh, underpenetrated areas of medicine in terms of knowledge base, and but secondarily, the ones that have the highest impact. And one of those, obviously, let's talk about microbiome first. So, so on average, you have about 40 trillion cells in your body, but you have about 10 times as many bacteria in your gut. And so when you realize that you've got all these commensal bacteria that are living with you, uh, that have been put there evolutionarily and, and have been part of your evolutionary uh, microbiome for years, it turns out they have an immense impact on your health. And we don't really, up until recently, most people in medicine didn't even acknowledge the, the existence of the microbiome. But we do know uh, today that it has huge impacts on, uh, you know, not only mental, uh, you know, uh, dementia, heart disease, inflammatory conditions. I mean, it is not uncommon any, uh, anymore inside the functional medicine community to have somebody who comes in who's got Crohn's disease and they can actually be taken off, taken off of their Humira or whatever their uh, immunosuppressive drug is and with a program to restore normal gut microbiome function can actually be off all of their medications. Okay, so that's not taught in medical school and it's not popular in the pharmaceutical business. But I could tell you from you know, going from a $60,000 a year drug to a $12,000 a year program that keeps you off of a drug that may in the long run cause an increased risk for cancer and all the other complications from those drugs. Uh, that is a, a classic case of microbiome. But the point is that we can now detect what, what is in your gut, healthy bacteria versus bad bacteria. And we can now start to change that and give you a different program so that you get a healthy gut bacteria. It feels uh, like yeah, AI, AI is going to be a big help there because it's, it's obviously enormous. a very complicated space of what's in your gut. It, it is. And we work with some of the top people in the field. Uh, uh, one of the friends of the company is a, a guy named Dr. Leo uh, Brady, and he's got a company out now called Jonah, which is uh, in, in just getting started. And Jonah is a fantastic AI company that is actually looking at all of your microbiome and how does your diet affect that? And then, you know, this is kind of where we get, kind of get back to the basics, right? We get back to... You know, it, it's interesting, you know, you look at ancient cultures and, you know, what they've done over the years and you look at turmeric and you look at curcumin and you look at, you know, the high fiber uh, vegetarian, you know, based diets. And, and kind of Ayurvedic stuff's been around for thousands of years as preventative yeah. medicine. Yeah. And the reason Ayurvedic it's been around is it works. It needs medicine. It works because it works because they've had a lot of years of trial and error. Okay. Right. And so, so I think that yeah. helps. But I think what's nice about it is now we're seeing the science catch up to you know, what has been known historically for years. So I think all of that is super important, but the impact between the microbiome and, and dementia is, un, it's, it really, it is a very, very strong association. And by improving somebody's microbiome, you can often improve their, their cognitive function significantly. And we just don't focus on it. Once again, this is not an area of medicine that we focus on. And so I think that's part of it. And, I, and you know, we want to, we, we measure all of that and treat all of that. The second part of this is mitochondrial function. And so mitochondrial function is probably the basis of most disease. We just don't, we just don't necessarily think about it. So when you think about the mitochondria, which are the back to, uh, the power plants of the cell, and we, we look at every major chronic disease condition, it involves some form of mitochondrial dysfunction. And particularly when you look at cancer, is another form of mitochondrial dysfunction. And so now for the first time, we can kind of measure mitochondrial dysfunction and you can restore mitochondrial dysfunction. And so the most common way to do that is uh, with a lactic acid test. Uh, some people would do a VO2 test to see what your zone two training heart rate is. And now the data is very clear. If you can train at zone two for 50 minutes, three to five times a week, you can actually restore mitochondrial function. And that's where the benefit of exercise comes in. You know, we talk about exercise for cardiovascular health. We talk about it for all of this, but it has an immense effect on every facet of your body, everything from cognitive function to microbiome function to lowering inflammatory levels. But what it does, all of that through mitigating mitochondrial dysfunction. And so you can improve mitochondria. You can improve the number of mitochondria you have per cell. You can improve the quality of the mitochondria you have per cell. And we know that people who even have had cancer and have recovered from cancer 
when put on an aggressive mitochondrial uh, restoration program, don't usually get much of a recurrence at all. And Dr. Messier has shown that in her work. So I think all of this is understanding what is the root cause for whatever dysfunction you have, not giving you a symptom suppressive medication, but let's dig a little deeper and find out exactly why you have that condition in the first place. Yeah, and this sim symptom suppressant medication, I mean, that is the entire system mainly. 90%. 90% of medications are symptom suppressive. So, so when you look at that, and not my, not our work, but Dr. Eric Verdin uh, will tell you from the Buck Institute, he will tell you that FDA approved medications, when you really look at look at them, uh, they're only really effective in about 25% of the population. And it has to do with how the studies are conducted and who has been eliminated from the studies. And then, if you actually look at most of our studies in the U.S., uh, you know they tend to be in white males. You know, we don't have a preponderance of females in the studies, and we don't have a very good representation of minorities in the studies, uh, you know, at, and, and, you know, people of color. So, so, and by the way, the United States is the most gener genetically heterogeneous planet, uh, as country on the planet, maybe with the exception of the UK. So how are we possibly making these, you know, generic recommendations? You know, we, we know that it, it just, a lot of this flies in the, in the face of common logic. And I just would tell you that, you know, it, as we move forward, and the reason we started the company was to harness this technology to be able to change the trajectory of healthcare. Because if we don't do that, we won't be able to afford, or we won't like. I can guarantee you the result that will be will be or the decisions will be for, forced to make. Last year in the United States, we spent about three hundred billion dollars on memory care facilities alone, meaning that. And, and by the way, if you're a male and you're put in memory care, your life expectancy is, is about thirteen months. Wow. Yeah, I'd say, you know, we, we, we uh, first of all, our elderly do deserve better, number one. And number two, uh, we're expecting that number of people needing memory care to increase by fivefold in the next 30 years. And that is because people have dementia because they're living longer. But the reality is we know with brain scans and AI overlays, we can tell you, plus your genetics, we can tell you what your risk are and show you a pathway to hopefully not ever develop that in the first place, even if you have bad genetics, because genes are not destiny and everybody thinks they are. But there are a lot of people that, you know, live a full life without ever, you know, they have two bad genes for Alzheimer's. Yeah, genes are a probability, not a certainty, right? That's absolutely right. And we know this with uh, all the epigenetic modifications that we can see. And you can see this in David Sinclair's work and George Church's work at Harvard. You can modify how gene expression happens. It's this it's this idea of genetic plasticity that we don't really think about very much. But the, the human body is a very uh, plastic uh, you know, structure in terms of its ability to change. Neuroplasticity, genomic plasticity, biologic plasticity, all of these are things that can be changed, but you just need a different plan. And the current plan that we have in the US is just wait until you break and then we'll fix you. And we never really fix you, we just patch you until you have another recurrence. So it's a, it's a little bit of an arcane situation. Um, what do you think of the kind of movement, the David Sinclair movement and Peter Atia, and there's a whole bunch of people who are approaching this in different ways. And some of them are like, just take preventative anti-inflammation stuff or whatever it may be, whether it's metformin or whether it's um, uh, NMM or whatever. How do you think about that? Is that an approach or is that a bit of a blunt tool as well, really? Compared to so I, I think all of it is relevant. I think the real question is, you know, I, and you know, what we're what we're about at Fountain is getting, giving you the most comprehensive deep dive into your health as you can get, and then figuring out what it what are the parts of your, uh, and that, you know, what are the parts of your health that we want to work on, and so we we come at this a little differently in that we do a very deep dive baseline. We will determine what what's going on, and then we prescribe what you need specifically. There's nothing wrong with metformin, but I will tell you there are some people that cannot tolerate metformin. If you do metformin, it's hard to weight train. It's hard to do cardiovascular exercise. I mean, there are uh, there, once again that is a um, that's a tool that people are using in uh, a mass fashion, uh, you know, for the mass population looking for a. There are twelve hallmarks of aging, 12 pathways of aging that we're aware of. So the, the likelihood that we'll find one solution that hits all 12 hallmarks of aging is probably unlikely. Uh, but does it mean that they don't work? No, I think they probably do in certain percentages of the population. 
Certainly uh, fasting, intermittent fasting, nothing wrong with intermittent fasting. Once again, how many cultures have been doing fasting for thousands of years? Thousands of years. Not, not new, right? Uh, it rediscovered recently, right? In, a, in, a, in an era of food abundance, uh, you know, we, we do rediscover these things over and over again. But I think that um, I think there are lots of opportunities uh, for and, and I, I look, I applaud everybody in the field that's looking at you know, all of these pathways, because we will get to a point fairly quickly, I think, in the next 10 to 15 years where we will have some significant interventions. And we've seen some amazing gene writing technologies that are happening at Harvard and, and down out on the West Coast to be able to start to change the trajectory of healthy aging. But what we know today with what we know today, and these aren't my words, these are Dr. Verdin's word from the uh, Buck Institute. Eric will tell you with what we know today, you should be able to make 98 healthy with what we know today. The problem is it's not a lack of knowledge. It's just an unequal distribution of that knowledge. What is the current health span as opposed to lifespan, you think? Uh, if you, with what we know today, you can have a healthy lifespan in 98. We know that today. And what is it currently, the actual? It's probably health. closer to you spend the last decade of your life in decline, essentially. Seven, so 70 is your? Probably 70, and then you start to see the gradual decline. And that's what we do. And what do we do at your doctor's office? We manage that decline. We don't like, your doctor's not looking at you saying, hey, let's optimize your health. Let's check your microbiome. Let's get your muscle mass up. By the way, if we get your muscle mass up, you're going to improve your cognitive function. You know, um, I mean, these things are not taught. And so what we do is we tend to give you that so symptom suppressive drug. And the, the, the problem is it's not the doctor's intent is wrong. It's just they've been given the wrong tools or haven't been trained in any of the latest tools that are available. So let's get specific for a, a, somebody coming in to Fountain Life. How does it work? Because I've been meaning to do this myself. So I'm very interested. What's one thing you need to overcome is people are going to come in with fear because they know you guys know what you're doing and you will find anything that's there and it's going to sound scary at first. So how do you first, you know, somebody's looking at this, they're, they're thinking, oh my God, they're going to find they're going to die tomorrow. How do you get over that first hurdle? Very, very common. Uh, a lot of people are very concerned and I understand that. We understand the trepidation to, to taking a look. Uh, but the reality is I tell people you would rather find out early than find out late. Yeah, of course. So, so it is It is intuitively obvious. But what we do is we uh, our, our setting is more like a spa than a, than a medical facility. It's a blend of a medical facility and a spa. It takes about a half a day, uh, five to six hours to go through the entire process. Uh, people come in either in the morning or in the afternoon. They're usually fasting. We draw all the necessary bloods. And then we start you into the testing process. So uh, you, we're going to look at your cardiac scan. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to do a lung scan on you as well. Uh, we, we do a, a combination of imaging, whole body imaging, uh, AI overlays for your brain, your body, body composition. So we're going to do a lot of uh, imaging. Uh, we're also going to do the baseline DEXA scan, things of that nature. And then we're going to start to work on uh, some blood samples. Uh, we're going to look at your genomics uh, blood samples. We're going to look at microbiome. We're going to look at uh, you know uh, toxicology. I mean, toxicology is a huge problem right now. And people are unaware because everybody says go eat fish, and so they go eat fish, and they eat tuna, and they eat swordfish, and they find out mercury. They, have they have mercury, right? Or they have arsenic, or they live near a chemical plant they're unaware of, right? Geomedicine is a big part of this. Where do you live? What's the water quality in your area? You you may not know these things, right? And so we we were going to check you for toxicology. Uh, then after we do a baseline of all of those, then we're going to do some other cognitive assessment uh, test on you. We we'd like to get a baseline cognitive test on you. Uh, we're going to check your grip strength because there's a high correlation with grip strength and, and uh, longevity. Uh, we also do uh, a litany of other tests, olfactory tests. We check you for uh, sleep apnea, which is a huge contributor to heart disease. There's lots of these things that we're going to do. But more importantly, with our people who have our Apex membership, which is our most common membership, they get a full year of follow-up with, with not a doctor, but a care team. Yeah, because this is not a one-off thing. This is It's a membership, right? You You're there to be part of something to help you in your journey through life, right? And then part of that is also, you know, we, we really think of this as a, uh, it's a lifelong long life membership. And the goal is to have access to the latest technology as it comes out under one roof so that you, and, and that you can do this on your own. And some people do, they're biohackers and they go from Produvo to go get a scan here, to go get a scan here, but then they have all their results. And 
you know, if you take your average Pernuvo scan, which is amazing, uh, and those guys are doing a great job, but if you take that average scan, your full body MR, and you take it to your average family doctor, they really don't know what to do with it, right? So it's a little bit like taking, you know, um, a Greek manuscript uh, to an English professor, right? I mean, you know, I mean, who's not trained in the classics. So I think that's part of the problem because they really don't know what to do with the data. Um, but, you know, our teams are, are, are trained and obviously in all of that. And then we're going to look, uh, and then over a course of a couple of weeks, you're going to get a full comprehensive readout of all of your test results. And then a plan on, you know, okay, so first of all, what are your goals? Because we start with what your goals are personally. And once we rule you out for heart disease and cancer and the things you're going to be really concerned about and aneurysm, things of this nature, uh, then um, then it's a question of how do we optimize your health? What do you want to do? You know, what, what are your goals personally? And then what can we do to optimize every facet of your life so that you can live as robust a life as you possibly can? And once again, like Peter says, you want to intercept this technology that's coming, which is going to be here, I think, much sooner than most people think in terms of being able to do healthy life extension. Now that is not going to reverse every bit of bad decisions we've made uh, up until then. But I think, you know, for people who take a proactive approach to their health and want a better, deeper vibe into their health, they'll be able to intercept this technology that's coming. And are you finding that people coming in are still predominantly older people, you know, Somebody like me who's in the mid fifties is now starting to think about this, or are you starting to get younger people who are starting to think, okay, actually, if I can do this earlier, it's going to pay huge dividends. Yeah. So I think there. So once again, that's that generational divide. I would tell you our average client's fifty, uh, which right. is pretty normal. Makes uh, sense. Yeah. Yeah. People as as young as eighteen. Okay. Uh, and and as old as you know, uh, I think the oldest client we've had is eighty five. And and part of that is also the understanding is that it doesn't matter what age you start because of the genetic and the biologic plasticity that you possess. Um, you can make a change. Uh, in as little as six months with almost anything that's going on in your body. So I think you can certainly improve uh, a lot of different things, certainly muscle mass and things of this nature. But I think what we're finding now is as we move a little past the, the baby boomer generation into the Gen X and the millennials, they want the data and they want their data right now. I mean, and that's the important part. The, the millennials and the Gen Xers, they want their data and they want to know what's going on. And so for them, they don't, they, they don't really see a downside to doing any of the testing. Um, we, we have it, you know, our program's not inexpensive uh, right now, but what we're in the process of doing is working to find ways to democratize access to this. And that's really what we get excited about. And so ongoing, so I've had my test back, I've had the general guidance, then what happens over the, the rest of the year or few years? How, how do I then use the services of this incredible array of technology and doctors and brains and stuff. So anytime you're, once you're a fountain member, you can go to any fountain center for any of the add-on testing that you may want to do throughout the course of a year. We're going to continue to do blood testing with you remotely. We're going to continue to, you know, send different test kits to you periodically, things that we want to work on us. Uh, and, and we will continue to tweak your program, you know, depending on what your blood work is showing us and what, you know, our questionnaires that we're going to be sending to you uh, will give us more information. And then, you know, you may be somebody who wants to go in and have one of the more advanced treatments that we have. Uh, you know, one of the big issues right now is plastics and microplastics in the environment. And everybody's concerned about that. And there was just a study that was published in Italy that they found microplastics in the plaque of the arteries of people that they were biopsying, right? So 57% of the people that had actually had microplastics in the plaque, in the artery plaque, right? So, so as we know that we've, you know, pretty much contaminated a lot of the oceans today, uh, how do you start to do that? Well, you can actually get rid of that through therapeutic plasma exchange or TPE. And that that is a way, you know, we've been doing plasma donations for years, but that is a one way to kind of lower plastic count, counts in your body. But there are other things you can do, uh, certainly TPE. Uh, there are uh, some regenerative technologies that we offer in our centers where you can have access to some of the latest uh, uh, cellular technology under FDA protocols. And we do this under FDA approved study where you might get NK cell therapy or you might, uh, which is natural killer cell therapy, or you might get stem cell therapy, depending on what, what we think you may need. But we do those under, in a few of our centers. Uh, but most of our clients, it's a one year, every follow-up, they come back in, they do a download uh, or an upload, I said, once a year, uh, they go the entire process and then almost everything else is done remotely. So it doesn't require you to physically be at a center. 
uh, to get your ongoing follow-up. And we have people that come in from all over the world. So we have a lot of European clients uh, that we continue to consult with uh, remotely for that. Uh, so there's, there's the remote he- care as well. So there's like the Zoom call with the experts and that kind of thing. How Absolutely. And, we, and if we find something for you, let's say you come through and we find a cancer, we're going to make sure you get to the best treatment. And we have, uh, you know, depending on our four centers, we have one in Dallas, one in New York, one in uh, Naples, Florida here, and then one in Orlando. And we have relationships with some of the top treatment centers so that we'll get make sure you get the right care that you need and get expedited. So for the people who, I mean, there's a whole lot of people in Real Vision, I'm sure are going to be interested in what you're doing and can afford it, but there's a bunch of people who can't. So, and you said you're working to democratize that, which is which is great news. And I know you know Peter and um, and um, Tony have been all you know. They're, they're, everybody's looking to do this, but what are the basic steps people should just do? If you would just get somebody in and said, "Listen, forget about the testing, everything else, right now. You know the super stuff. These are the things you should do." What would you what do you recommend? Yeah. So, so uh, I, yeah. I, I, it's not a shameless plug, but I will tell you, we're going to launch a digital program uh, that will be uh, launched sometime next month in a beta pilot in Dallas uh, with uh, invited country clubs. There are about 480,000 members. And that involves uh, four times a year blood draw, uh, follow up with functional medicine physicians, uh, follow up with a health coach to kind of get you started to get started. And then that would give you access if they felt like your next step would be a whole body MRI. And that that overall, that one year, uh, you know, testing that membership is going to be about $3,000, a little bit more accessible to the average person. But more importantly, if you needed to get that whole body MRI, you could go to a fountain center if you're close by or if you wanted to make the travel and you could get your heart checked and you could get uh, your, uh, your whole body MRI or get a, a grail test. So those are some things that you could do on an a la carte fashion. Uh, what people ask me all the time is, you know, what is the biggest secret to longevity? You know, uh, number one, uh, that one thing that's been correlated the most of anything else with longevity is actually muscle mass. The higher your muscle mass, the, that cohort of people with the highest quartile of muscle mass lives the longest and is the most disease free. Because one of the things we have underappreciated, even in the orthopedic community, is how unbelievably regenerative muscle uh, strength training is for your entire body. So people who have early cognitive decline and go into strength training can improve their cognitive function as well. Why in that kind of blue zone analysis, the Mediterraneans, you know, I lived in Spain for 10 years. Why, that, I mean, they don't have muscle mass. Americans generally have more muscle mass uh, from the higher protein diet and they do more gym stuff. I guess a lot of the longevity people probably have stronger muscles because they're walking up and down hills and they walk more, but they're not, they're not classically like gym people. Right. So when I when I say muscle mass, I think you have to look at it as a percentage of overall body composition. Okay. So what it is is that they have a, a very high amount of lean muscle mass, not a bodybuilder. I mean, I, people think you know you go in the gym, it's all about bodybuilding, and certainly that component. I wouldn't say it's the bodybuilders, but it's the people with the highest quartile of muscle are the ones that live the longest, and that means that in order to maintain your muscle, they have to be active. And so they are in those blue zone areas. And I just was, that was, was with Dan Buettner at a meeting recently. And you look at what everything he's done there and what he's analyzed. And first of all, uh, their diet is really super helpful, right? And so it's clean air, clean water, diet, sleep, community, and exercise. And really, when you look at what they eat, uh, it's not heavily predicated toward meat, I, I would say uh, animal protein, but there are a lot of proteins in plants. And they tend to be fairly heavy on that. Now, I don't know that, you know, they get, they probably get on average about 0.7 grams uh, per uh, pound of lean body weight, which is probably enough. I don't think you need a gram uh, necessarily, but I think that that's kind of where they live. Uh, but I will tell you, I think the biggest impact that the Blue Zones has is because of the heavy plant base of the diet, uh, their microbiome is very healthy. They have a really super healthy microbiome. And so we're kind of back to that original scenario, right? So I think that that's part of it. I think w- when you live in a Western society or a high stress society, um, you know, it's it's very hard to have and adopt that type of a, of a lifestyle always. Uh, but if you are in the right location where, and, and our goal here is to really right size and in, to, I would say, correct the imbalances in your body. Because if we can eliminate the toxins and we can eliminate some of these things and get your 
your own innate ability to recover back to baseline, then that's your best chance. I mean, almost all of aging is a fight between inflammation and regeneration. And if we can keep the inflammatory process low enough, the regenerative process will take care of itself usually. So outside of building muscle mass, what are the other things that people, everybody should think about? Sleep is enormous. Uh, I think we that's have- the hardest one. People just go, oh yeah, you should get eight hours sleep. No <laughs> shit, Sherlock. How are you supposed to do that? Very hard. There, there is an actually a really good book by, by Dr. Matt Williams, uh, and uh, it is called Why We Sleep, and we highly recommend it because there What's are it called? a lot. Sorry? It's called Why We Sleep by Dr. Williams, uh, Matt Williams. He's a Stanford uh, trained uh, sleep specialist, and uh, it's a fascinating book. It's very easy to read, uh, but there's some things around sleep hygiene that we just don't think about. And one is uh, make sure you're not in a real high EMF level. And so, if there are a lot of electrical components around your bed, you know. You need to really get uh, get into a quiet zone before you go to sleep. Turn the lights down, all of that. I mean, if you're in an area where you can't really do that, you know, blue blockers, things of that nature will help. The second part of that is, uh, you know, which is harder uh, is for some people is that you really uh, sleep. Uh, alcohol is terrible for sleep. Try to drink alcohol before you go to sleep. You will you have a decrement of about 10 percent of the quality of your sleep with one drink. So getting rid of alcohol, particularly over the peri uh, around the peri bedtime area. The, the third part of this is getting the temperature of the room down because you really need the temperature of the room down to be at least uh, about a cent. You'd like it ideally at least one degree below uh, what your body temperature is while you're sleeping at night. And when I say that body temperature, I mean, you want your overall temperature to be much cooler in the room. So you can do that with chili pads. You can do that with a sleep aid bed, anything to keep the body temperature cooler because that will induce really good sleep. What we know about sleep is that when people sleep and once they get into that deep sleep, particularly uh, that component of their uh, sleep cycle, that's when the brain really rinses itself from toxins. And that's why it's so important and it's really hard. The other thing is uh, exercise is extremely important, maybe not right prior to bed, but exercise will also help you in a deeper sleep pattern. There are lots of sleep aids out there. Uh, I, I, I can't detail them all here, but I would tell you that book uh, is very helpful. And that's the hardest thing for most people to adopt. But once they get into a good sleep hygiene pattern, uh, it just has so many benefits and the help of recharging the brain and cleaning the brain from uh, debris uh, and improving overall outlook. Uh, we think that's extremely important. So final one, what kind of diets should people think about? I know that's a very broad, varied topic, but give somebody so, sort of a general directional true north so do this you're doing all right yeah generally speaking you know we are advocates of uh of a more plant-based diet we don't we're, we're you know i tell people every time i see nobody can be a purist i mean we're all not going to be brian johnson okay brian johnson you know I mean, he, he's a he's a testament to human perseverance and the willing to try everything which i think is great but most people don't fall in that camp right most people are and so i tell most of our clients you know it's an 80 20 rule Get about 80% of it right. Don't stop living, first of all, because, you know, life, if, if you're miserable, that's a stressor. Uh, and so you, you can't do that. But I do think it's it's really important uh, on diet to, number one, find out what your microbiome, if you have a healthy microbiome or not, and, you know, get that tested because that's extremely important. But generally speaking, most humans do better with more plants and less, uh, less you know, red meat, protein. Not that it... Protein's bad, okay? You need to make sure you get the right quantity of protein. But it's the fiber content in plants. It's the phenol content in plants. It's all of those components that help feed the healthy microbiome. And that's what's important to do. But I think a lot of this needs to be uh, very carefully curated with what your microbiome looks like. And, and are you having gut issues? If you're having gut issues, find out why and restore your healthy gut microbiome and then Lots of ways to do that. If you're having dietary issues, you can do elimination diets. There's all kinds of things. Um, everybody's different. And so we try not to make generic recommendations, although it is clear that mostly, you know, 80, 70% plant-based diets, people probably do better. And fish preferable over other forms of protein, I guess. I, I think fish is great. Animal protein. I, think, I think on balance, that is definitely true. Uh, and I think, you know, if you can get your protein sources from plant-based uh, as well, that's that's great as well. Bill, this has been fascinating. I'm definitely coming in. I just need to find some time to come to Naples, but I'm well, definitely let, let coming. Let me know if you want to come to Naples or Orlando or whatever, or Dallas, uh, just let me know. Call, just call me and send me a note. And 
I'm happy to. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll definitely. I, I just need to book it and then I'll come. That'd be great. I look forward to having. Fantastic. You. I really appreciate your time, and I'm sure we'll get you back at some point because right. I know people are going to be fascinated by this. It's right. It's it's like the hottest topic in the world for many people now, and rightly so after so long. Absolutely. No, I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in. And I'm happy to come back anytime. Uh, there's lots of other things we can talk about too that are really exciting that are on the horizon. Fabulous. All right, Bill. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Okay. So there was a lot in that and you can see how fast things are moving. You can see the scale of the problem um, of healthcare and how it's just suppressing symptoms. It's not really solving why we get ill or why we age or why we end up with chronic diseases. But the, the technology is now available, and the people are there, and these clinics are being built, and there are others like it. Um, and I think it's a really, really interesting area for all of us to explore, to read up on, and experiment with. It's all about unfucking your future in the way that probably matters the most. Now, the costs aren't for everybody, but there were some pointers there as well of, how you can think about living your life and the simple life hacks that might make a huge difference to your health span. Now, if you are interested in unfucking your future, which I think every single person watching this should be, and everybody is, because we want to deliver that future vision of ourselves, then obviously we've been running this two weeks on Real Vision about how to unfuck your future, where we go through all the big problems, whether it's the health problems, but also the solutions, or whether it's the mess central banks have got us into and how to how to solve for that. You know, we are very cognizant of the problems that face us, but we're also optimists that there is solutions for all of us. And they're not that difficult to do. We just need to be aware of them. So on Friday the 22nd of March, so this by the time this video comes out, it will have just come out, or just coming out the following day. We're actually running a workshop as part of uh, Real Vision Plus, and you can sign up for a $1 trial membership for it. Um, and it's actually a workshop to culminate everything we've done during the House of Unfuck Your Future two weeks. And I think there's four major sessions. One is for young people, how to think about planning, financial planning for your life, how to think about you know buying a house, saving, investing, all of those things. I think that's going to be super fascinating. We're also going to have a, a discussion on people who are going to go, uh, who are going to retire, or who have retired. How to think things through in an intelligent way that makes sense to give you the highest chance of not running out of money, which is obviously everybody's biggest fear. We've also got one on in, uh, two panels on investing, where we think the key trends, the secular trends that I've identified, are obviously technology, and we're looking at how options can help you in some of that. And we've got the Najarian brothers joining, who are two good friends of mine. Um, they'll be joining Imran to talk about options and how you can use options to enhance your portfolio. Also on the portfolio side, we've got Jamie Coots to talk about how to invest in crypto. Because I know many of you don't really know how to or want to know more. Well, Jamie's going to help you in that. So that's an incredible workshop, four whole panels, lots to get out of it. You can ask questions, get involved. There'll be discussion forums afterwards. So that's um, uh, just realvision.com. It's, it's signing up for, the, um, for Real Vision Plus, and there's the, uh, there's the $1 membership. So I think it's realvision.com forward slash future. Anyway, the link's below. Uh, sign up for that. It will change your life. Be the best dollar you'll ever spend in your entire life. Anyway, see you next time. Hi. On June 5th and 6th, 2024, I'll be speaking at the largest AI event in Asia, Super AI in Singapore at the iconic Marina Bay Sands. Alongside brilliant minds like Benedict Evans, Balaji, and Edward Snowden, I'll be on stage exploring the extraordinary potential of AI and the profound change it represents, not just for financial markets, but for the world as we know it. With over 5,000 attendees and over 150 side events, Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a full week from June the 3rd to the 9th. Visit realvision.com forward slash super AI to register and join me with 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION, all in caps.
We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.